Thank you for the invitation to deliver this charter lecture for 2020. I'm Jackie Piner and the title of the lecture is Adapting to the Evolution in Pharma R&D. As an employee of GSK, I would like to say that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation and on the following slides are solely those of the presenter and not necessarily those of GSK. Here's what I'm going to cover today. I'll briefly describe how new medicines are developed, then I'll review drug development over the last 30 years, including a personal perspective, and I'll also highlight some key biological innovations which have impacted drug development. And we'll finish by looking to the future. I'd just like to thank Steve Hood and Theo Dare, two GSK uh, colleagues for inspiration. I'll start by describing my career over the last 30 years, which has been based within a, a global pharmaceutical company and has been mainly been focused on the safety of potential new medicines, but has involved partnerships and collaborations with the wider scientific community. Back in September 1989, I joined a company called Glaxo in a specialised role as a reproductive toxicologist, where the main purpose was providing data to predict if a potential uh, new medicines interfere with normal reproduction. I was privileged to study for a part-time PhD in male reproduction and this led to an industry academia collaboration which was looking at in vitro models for, mat for, mat for matogenesis. Into the 2000s partnerships expanded and I began to diversify in my career. I monitored studies that were placed at contract research organisations and I became involved with a number of learned societies. I also became involved in the strategic side of drug development, where I represented non-clinical safety assessment on global multidisciplinary teams, and this has continued to the present day. There were new industry academic collaborations in the 2010s, which were focused on training safety scientists for the future. I was also fortunate to go on a part-time secondment to the University of Cambridge. I stepped out from non-clinical safety for a couple of years, where I had a role supporting open innovation. And last September, I celebrated 30 years of continuous service. So let's look at developing new medicines. So how do we develop new medicines? The drug discovery and development is commonly organised as a pipeline and represented as a chevron like this one on the slide. Pre-discovery involves identifying the target disease and potential targets for intervention. Proteins are the most common targets and include enzymes, cell signaling receptors, structural proteins and regulatory factors such as protein kinases. Next, multiple drug candidates are developed and must be shown to reach the target and modulate its activity in vivo whilst acting within acceptable safety margins. A preclinical development phase follows where the compound is tested in vitro and in vivo, where safety and disposition of the molecule is assessed. Data from this phase are used to determine whether to proceed into human testing. Phase one clinical trials determine the safety of single doses in a small number of healthy volunteers. If the treatment proves to be safe, phase two studies begin to determine the effectiveness of the drug in people with a condition to be tested. These studies last several months or years and involve larger numbers of people, perhaps one or two hundred. If, drug, if the drug shows effectiveness, phase three studies are conducted in hundreds of people. These clinical trials take place at different locations and across several countries and may last several years. Data are presented to the regulatory authorities and a marketing authorisation or licence is issued. Once the newly uh, licensed medicine is in general use, it will be carefully monitored for safety by post-marketing evaluation. This cartoon is a more realistic depiction of drug development, which shows the long road to a new medicine. You can see it isn't a linear process. The cost increases sharply as the project moves into the later phases of clinical development. Also, it should be noted that it may be necessary to go back and find a new molecule if safety or efficacy requirements are not met. So drug development is a lengthy, complex and costly process associated with a high degree 
uncertainty that a drug will succeed. So why is this? So the cost of developing new medicines must take into account failures. So what are the largest sources of failure in drug development? If we look at the publication here from 2015, where combined data on the attrition of drug candidates from a number of companies were evaluated. Non-clinical toxicology was by far the highest cause of attrition, accounting for 40% of the failures, which is most prominent in the preclinical phase. Failures of clinical safety reasons were most prominent in phase one, and lack of efficacy most prominent in phase two but there were still a significant number of safety failures uh, apparent in phase two. As already mentioned, drug development is more costly once in the big clinical trials. And so failures in these stages is costly and the time taken to reach this stage must also be taken into consideration. So confidence in safety and efficacy must be developed earlier in the process uh, to improve cost effectiveness. This is another publication which again shows lack of efficacy and safety are the main reasons for drug development failure. My role in non-clinical safety involves assessing the safety of new molecules early in the process and deselecting those with unacceptable safety profiles or designing strategies to manage the risk for a much needed medicine for an unmet need. So let's look at drug development over the last 30 years. Let's start by looking what the world looked like in the 1980s. I'll start by talking about my world. I did a biology degree at the University of Manchester, uh, 1980 to 1983. My career aspirations were, and still are, to contribute and feel that my work makes a difference. My first job was as a medical laboratory scientific officer in clinical biochemistry which involved analysis of blood, urine, and other body fluids. Tests included basic metabolic profiles, lipid profiles, arterial blood gases, and more specialized uh, assays. I worked first in a general hospital in Wigan, and then moved to a large teaching hospital in Manchester. It was during the middle of the late 1980s when we began to get blood samples, which were treated as high risk from patients with a newly described disease called AIDS. In 1989, I moved to Colgate Palmolive for a role based in the R&D unit with additional responsibilities for microbiology as well as analytical chemistry. Sadly, six weeks after joining, the unit was closed as the R&D moved to the US and I was made redundant. So what was happening in the world? The first, the first space shuttle, Columbia, lifts off in 1981. US President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev eased tensions between the two superpowers leading to the end of the Cold War. The Iran-Iraq war leads to over 1 million dead and 1 trillion US dollars spent. And Ethiopia's food shortages and hunger crisis from 1983 to 85 led to an estimated 1 million famine deaths. In 1985, the Live Aid concert is held in order to fund relief efforts for the famine in Ethiopia. The Live Aid picture here is of Freddie Mercury, who was diagnosed with HIV AIDS in 1987. The same year, a new drug, AZT, becomes the first approved treatment for HIV. During this lecture, we'll, we'll follow how AIDS HIV has been treated over the years as an example of drug development. At the end of the decade, in September 1989, I started work at Glaxo Group Research as a reproductive toxicologist. So let's look at the pharmaceutical R&D during the 1990s. So the 1990s is considered a golden era in the pharmaceutical industry that yielded several blockbuster drugs. A blockbuster drug is a very popular drug that generates annual sales of one billion US dollars or more. Common blockbuster drugs are Lipitor, a statin used to, to uh, lower cholesterol, developed by Pfizer. Also Vioxx, developed by Merck, as a COX-2 anti-inflammatory drug used in arthritis conditions and pain, which is voluntarily withdrawn from the market because of safety concerns. A big problem was that when a drug's patent expires, the market is flooded with generic drugs. 
and this negatively impacts sales of the blockbuster drug. The 1990s was also an era of mergers and acquisitions. Um, and, 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 and that most of the activity in the 1990s was horizontal mergers. For example, in 1995, Glaxo Welcome was formed. 96, Novartis was formed by a merger of Sibagaygi and Sandos. In 98, um, merger of Astra and Zeneca. In 1999, the biggest ever acquisition occurred where Warner Lambert was acquired by Pfizer costing 112 billion US dollars at the time. And finally, in, into the new decade of 2000, saw the formation of GlaxoSmithKline from a merger between GlaxoWellcome and SmithKline and Beecham. Freddie Mercury died in November 1991 at the age of 45 from bronchial pneumonia resulting from AIDS. However, during the 1990s, there were, there were incredible advances in the understanding of HIV, uh, but AIDS still remained a challenging disease to treat. Resistance to AZT therapy increased, and the increase of viral strains eliminated hope for a single easy form of vaccination. A major advance came in 1996, when researchers found that triple drug therapy could suppress HIV replication to minimal levels. The triple combination comprised uh, two antiviral drugs with one of the new protease inhibitors. However, there were side effects and the daily dosing regime was complex and resistance continued to be a problem. Treatment with antiretrovirals was expensive at the time, with HIV um, ranging with treatments uh, ranging from 10 to 15,000 to 15,000 US dollars a year. In 1996, around 23 million people around the world were living with HIV and AIDS. And by 99, AIDS-related disease illnesses were the fourth leading cause of death worldwide and the number one killer in Africa. So what biological innovation had an impact on drug development in the 1990s? I've chosen high throughput screening. And this resulted from the vast increase in the number of potential drugs produced through combinatorial chemistry. So using robotics, data processing, software, liquid handling devices and sensitive detectors, high throughput screening allowed millions of chemical, genetic or pharmacological tests to occur. And through this process, it is possible to rapidly identify active compounds, antibodies or genes that modulate a biomolecular pathway. I thought I'd also mention that Glaxo Welcome Medicines Research Centre in Stevenage opened in April 1995 and we're celebrating virtually 25 years of science at Stevenage this year. So let's map what we've just heard about the bigger picture to a personal perspective. As already mentioned, I started at what was Glaxo Group Research as a reproductive toxicologist where my role was hazard identification of new medicines, a regulatory requirement before women of childbearing potential were enrolled into clinical trials. And this originated from the thalidomide scandal, where pregnant women were prescribed thalidomide to overcome morning sickness, resulting in children born with a range of disabilities, including shortening and absence of limbs, malformation of hands and digits, and damage to the brain and internal organs. And it turns out that my mother was prescribed thalidomide when she was pregnant with me in 1961, uh, but was sick probably before the drug was absorbed. All my work in the 1990s was on medicines that made it to the market, and there's some examples shown on the slide here. I was invited to study for a part-time PhD to increase the company knowledge on male reproductive toxicology. There were some unusual testicular findings for a failed candidate which was intended to be a backup for Imigran used for migraine, but the failed candidate was never given to people and Imigran did not have the findings. My academic supervisor was Professor Richard Sharp at the MRC Centre for Reproduction in Edinburgh. This was an exciting time when falling, falling sperm counts in men was in the news and TV programmes like Horizon covered the topic. 
I used the failed uh, pandidate as a tool molecule. This was a 5-HT1 agonist, and when given to rats, extremely high doses resulted in distension of the lumens of the seminiferous tubules in the testis. Um, and you can see this in the top panel. Uh, it's a time course. Uh, on the very top um, left is a control, and you can see with time that the lumens of these tubules expand greatly. The testicular vasculature was implicated as the initial target, as you can see in the pictures uh, at, the, at the bottom there. And again, the second panel in shows um, some blood vessels in the pampiniform plexus, which are very much reduced in size. They're very much constricted. Subsequent work showed that the arterial venous anastomoses of the somatic cord were constricted or shut. These findings are consistent with a general pharmacological action of a 5-HT1 receptor agonist developed to act on arterial venous anastomoses of the carotid arterial bed in the relief of migraine. Black Soul Melt Welcome formed in 1995 and my department and job survived. Um, so the 1990s was a time of growing academic industry partnerships and I was fortunate to be involved in a European Commission project uh, to develop in vitro models of spermatogenesis. Such models are very much needed to provide an early indicator of effects on male reproduction, but appropriate assays are still limited. On to the 2000s where there was increased partnerships to bring new drugs to the market. The patents of many of the medicines that the industry launched during the blockbuster era of the 1990s were due to expire in the 2000s, leaving Big Pharma very exposed. Drug development costs continued to rise and saw a change to globalisation in the pharmaceutical industry, where China and India were seen to have large talent pools and offered preclinical and clinical services at significantly lower costs. Similarly, a steady rise in outsourcing of non-core activities led to the growth of contract research organisations with global operations. There was an increase in collaboration between researchers in academia and the pharmaceutical industry to discover new medicines. Academic institutions have the appropriate climate for creative and innovative science and the ability to translate fundamental science into therapeutics. And working with Big Pharma increases the diversity of approach to drug discovery. In terms of AIDS in the 2000s, the average life expectancy in Sub-Sahara Africa falls from 62 years to 47. However, there were price reductions for HIV uh, AIDS drugs to benefit the developing world. And by 2009, the US FDA had approved the, the, the 100th antiviral drug. Perhaps the most significant development was in reliable testing, where HIV tests detected both HIV antibodies and antigens, and results were available in as little as two weeks after infection. HIV testing is essential for slowing the spread of the HIV infection. Many people are unaware that they're infected with HIV so that they may be less likely to take precautions to help prevent spreading the virus to others. The biological innovation impacting development of new medicines that I'd like to highlight is the growth in biologics. Biologics are defined as large molecules typically derived from living cells and include therapeutic proteins, DNA vaccines, monoclonal antibodies and fusion proteins. Biologics are designed to have uh, very specific effects and to interact with specific uh, targets in the patient's body, mainly on the outside of cells. The more targeted mechanism of action should lead to a greater chance of the medicine having the required effect against the disease and should result in fewer side effects than the traditional medicines. Examples of biologics approved for use in the 2000s inclu include Bevacizumab from Genentech, now part of Roche, sold under the brand name of Avastim. It's used in the treatment of a number of cancers by blocking vascular endothelial growth factor and preventing the growth of new blood vessels that feed tumours. Another example is Septuximab, an epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor used to treat bowel cancer. So what did the 2000s look like for me? 
A consequence of the formation of GlaxoSmithKline was research units were localised. For reproductive toxicology, this was based in the US. So this provided the opportunity to diversify and I started to monitor both general, uh, general toxicology and reproductive toxicology studies performed at contract research organisations which were located globally. And this included biologics as well as the traditional small chemical molecules. Another consequence of the merger was a very rich pipeline of potential new medicines and I became involved with the strategic side of drug de development and represented non-clinical safety on global development teams. I was working on a diverse portfolio, including chemical and biologic drugs, for indications included substance dependence, multiple sclerosis, and some rare diseases. And this is the role I continue to perform to the current day. In order to maintain my special interest in reproductive toxicology, and to ensure the company was represented in the UK and Europe, I became actively involved in learned society, scientific societies, including the British Andrology Society, the European Teratology Society, and the UK Industrial Reproductive Toxicology Discussion Group. These professional bodies were multidisciplinary, and they included basic research through veterinary medicine and clinical andrology. And this diversity of thought and application was invaluable. Into the 2010s, this is a decade of open innovation in philanthropy. So first, what is open innovation? It's also known as pre-competitive collaboration. And it's where an organisation doesn't just rely on their own internal knowledge for innovation, but it uses various partnering models comprising academic institutes, large and small pharma, and contract research organisations. Examples include better understanding of complex diseases and the validation of novel biomarkers for prediction of efficacy and safety. What's meant by philanthropy in drug development? According to the World Health Organization, at least half of the global population of almost 8 billion people still do not have full access to essential health services. Tiered pricing is one of the most effective ways in which the pharmaceutical companies have been helping to improve access to medicines. This is where companies charge a higher price for the same product in higher income countries than in lower income countries. For example, low income countries and those with the severest HIV AIDS epidemics are offered branded antiretroviral drugs at significant discounts. Other examples include partnerships where non-profit organisations and governments work in collaboration to discover drugs for neglected diseases. So, for example, the, med the Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, was established by a few European governments together with the World Bank to reduce the disease burden of malaria infections. The main sponsor is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and there are partnerships with uh, the pharma industry. Since 2010, MMV have moved 17 candidates into preclinical development. Looking at HIV AIDS, there's been a, there was a unique partnership between uh, GSK, Pfizer and Shinogi and forming a company called Weave Healthcare. And this is focused on delivering advances in treatment and care for HIV communities. Weave Healthcare now has a portfolio of 13 HIV treatments. The biological innovation I want to highlight is biomarkers. A biomarker is a biological molecule found in blood, other body fluids and tissues, and it's an indicator of normal or abnormal process or disease. We're in an era of personalised precision medicines, and biomarkers are needed to improve diagnosis, monitor drug activity and therapeutic response. Recent advances in omics technologies, uh, for example, genomics, transcriptomics and proteomics, in combination with imaging, bioinformatics and, and biostatistics, has made it possible to accelerate the discovery and development of specific biomarkers for complex chronic diseases. So the 2010s provided plenty of opportunities for me to work with wider scientific communities while still developing new medicines. Firstly, there was the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is an EU public-private partnership uh, funding health research and innovation. 
I was involved with Safe SciMet, which is, was a training and education program in safety sciences for medicines, and it trains more than 800 scientists. This led to a visiting senior lecturer position at King's College London in pharmaceutical sciences, and I've just given a lecture there this morning. It was in the 2010s that I really began to contribute to the work of the RSB. I was looking to validate my, prof my professional development by gaining external recognition. At the time, I was on the register for toxicologists, and I decided to have my wider experience recognised by the RSB and obtained chartered biologist statement in 2011. And I was elected to be a fellow of the RSB in 2013. From 2014, I've been an active member of the Beds, Essex and Hearts branch, and I was delighted to be elected to council in 2019. I was also fortunate to be given the opportunity for a part-time secondment to manage the Cambridge Alliance of Medicine and Safety, which is a partnership between the University of Cambridge, the MRC Toxicology Unit, GSK and AstraZeneca. And this was established to build an active academic research program amongst university scientists whose work relates to the safety of medicines with strong links to pharma. During a period of reorganisation at GSK, there was an opportunity for a new role, which was supporting open innovation. A lot of the work uh, involved consulting for the Stevenage Bioscience Catalyst, which is based on the GSK campus. The picture here at the bottom shows three large buildings making up the catalyst in front of the, uh, the GSK buildings. There's around, there's around uh, 40 companies and academic groups making up the catalyst with a focus on therapeutics and cell and gene technologies. And finally, uh, I just put this panel in to show some of the diseases I've worked on or are currently involved with uh, as, a, as, a, uh, uh, as working on drug development teams. Uh, it's quite a diverse portfolio. Let's take our last look at HIV AIDS. And you can see from the picture on the, of the film, uh, from the film Bohemian Rhapsody, which was released in 2018 as a biography of, Fre of Freddie Mercury and featured Live Aid in 1985, which is where our story started. The panel on the right shows all currently approved antiretroviral drugs uh, organised by CLASS. Infection with HIV continues to be a serious health threat throughout the world, with more than 1 million infected individuals in the US and more than 40 million worldwide. Finally, let's look to the future. What does the, the uh, future for drug development look like? So this panel uh, summarises work conducted by researchers from the Deloitte Centre for Health Solutions who, interview, who interviewed 14 thought leaders and they highlighted uh, that advances in early detection will likely enable interventions that halt disease in the earliest stages before they progress to more serious conditions and make treatment for some diseases no longer uh, necessary. The possibility to match patients with customised drug cocktails or design therapies that would work for just a few people. So that's personalized medicines. Treatments that cure diseases could reduce or eliminate the demand for some prescription medicines. Non-pharmaceutical digital interventions, including those focused on behavioral uh, modification might also reduce or eliminate demand for medications. And finally, precise medical intervention uh, enabled by robotics, nanotechnology or tissue engineering could reduce the need for pharmaceutical intervention. And finally, uh, what can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? This maybe could give us some insight for the future of drug development. So this was the landscape of candidate vaccines in August when there were 28 uh, vaccines in development. And these all involve various combinations of partnerships between academia, biotech, not-for-profit organisations and pharma. And I just wonder if this indicates the direction drug development will take in the future. Finally, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. There should be some time for questions. Thank you.